Hi guys, Drea from Aloha Plant Life here and welcome back to my channel. And you may have noticed that I have swapped out my Monstera Deliciosa that usually lives here for my Salsa Dancer Hibiscus. And that is because today we are gonna be covering all things care related to hibiscus. And specifically, we're gonna be looking at tropical hibiscus today not hardy hibiscus. Now, if you're not sure the difference between the two, I'll flash up a comparison for you on screen real quick here. This one is the hardy hibiscus. That is not what we're gonna be talking about today. This is what most tropical hibiscus look like, and that is what we're gonna be talking about today. Now, the scientific name for these plants is Hibiscus rosa sinensis. Lots of S's in there. And these plants are perhaps best known for the beautiful flowers that they produce, which come in a variety of colors. The flowers for my particular plant will be red in nature, and they get fairly large. Now I will say that flowering can be a little bit tricky, especially when caring for hibiscus indoors, but we're gonna get into that here a little bit later. But let's start off talking about the growth pattern for these plants. Now, as you can see, very bush-like in terms of their growth pattern. However, you probably have seen a lot of them have been trained to look more like a tree where the stems are nice and tall and bare and then it's just bushy at the top. And that is basically accomplished through some very strategic pruning done at the start of every spring season in order to eventually get it to look that way. However, if you really like that look, a lot of places sell them already in that tree-like pattern versus the bush-like pattern. And it's really just personal preference as to what pattern you prefer. Now, mature size for these plants, especially when grown indoors or even if grown outdoors in a potted situation is going to be about five to six feet in height. Though you can keep them pruned to a smaller size if need be, but in general, they're gonna take up quite a bit of space, so make sure you've got plenty of room where you're planning on putting them. Now, they do grow relatively quickly during the spring and summer months. However, that growth typically slows down a bit when you move into fall and winter. Now, lighting, let's talk about lighting for these plants. These plants are full sun plants. They love light. They want all the light they can get, and they will definitely be happy to receive direct light as long as it's not too hot. And we'll get more into temperature with these plants here in a second. But they really, really need a lot of light and especially if you have a variegated variety in order to maintain that variegation they really need a lot of direct light so you're really going to need to put them in a southern facing window if at all possible or maybe a southwest facing window or southeast facing window assuming you live in the northern hemisphere like I do because that is going to provide the level of light that they are really really going to want. Now some signs you might see if your plant's not getting enough light as I mentioned a second ago if it is variegated you might start to lose that variegation but in general these plants will start to get very tall and very leggy and you will be seeing a lot of stem in between the leaves on that plant. That's a sign that it's not getting enough light and you need to move it to a brighter location. Let's talk about watering. When it comes to watering requirements for hibiscus, these plants like to be kept slightly more on the moist side. In the summer, I pretty much watered this one about once every three to four days, and it's in a big pot. So that's saying something, you know, for three to four days for it to need to have water. And usually the pot really only gets about a third, maybe max halfway dry before I have to give it water. So they really do like a more consistently moist soil, but not too moist. As with most plants, too moist can lead to problems such as root rot, but they definitely do not like to dry out completely. And I do have some good news for you. They are extremely vocal when it comes to if they need water or not. They will go from looking like this to looking like this in a course of about five minutes if they are thirsty. They droop so fast, it's crazy. So if your plant is drooping like what I just showed you, definitely time to go in and give it some water. Now in the winter months though, when the plant's not growing as much, you're not gonna need to water as frequently. I probably water her about once every five to seven days in the winter versus once every three to four in the summer. And because they like to have consistently moist soil, but they don't appreciate being overwatered, getting the soil right for these plants is very important. You need to have well-draining soil, but it doesn't need to be super chunky or super airy because then it's gonna be drying out way too quickly for these plants. So what I recommend using is about three quarters premium potting soil to one quarter extra drainage, such as perlite or pumice. That has done extremely well for my hibiscus. I have had no problems with that soil mix. So next, let's go ahead and talk about temperature range. There is a very kind of narrow window when it comes to temperature ranges for this plant. I learned that slightly the hard way because I did start with this plant outside and realized real quickly that she doesn't like it when it gets even remotely like too warm. And by too warm, I mean 85 degrees or higher. She was not having it. And that is why she lives inside now. But typically you're looking at a window of about 65 degrees Fahrenheit to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's where they're going to be the happiest. Now, once again, you will start to see pretty significant signs if they're getting overheated or too cold. 
So if they are getting overheated, they will start to droop just like they do if they need water. However, they might actually not need water. So if you're seeing that drooping and you know it's only been about a day since you have watered your hibiscus, I would definitely take a look at like how hot that plant is getting because perhaps even though this plant wants a lot of sun and a lot of direct sun, the sun coming through a window, especially depending on the quality of your window, could be heating the area around the plant up to a level that it's not happy with. So definitely if you see that drooping, you know you've watered it recently, kind of put your hand in front of the window, in between the window and the plant, see if it's feeling kind of hot. If it is, maybe in the afternoons, when that afternoon sun's beating in, you might just need to pull that plant back a few feet. Now, on the flip side, if this plant gets too cold, guess what? you're probably gonna see some drooping again. It's the only way this plant likes to communicate, at least in my experience, it droops when it's unhappy about something. And once again, if you have recently watered the plant and it's drooping, and let's say, for example, my heat went out this past winter, I woke up, it was 55 degrees in here, this plant was drooping like mad because it was too cold. And unfortunately, I couldn't really haul it upstairs where the heat was working, so I ended up wrapping blankets around the base of this. I got a space heater out put it by the plant, and next thing you know, 10 minutes later, she's perked back up looking like this. So always look at those signs of drooping and assess correctly. So just to recap, drooping could be we're thirsty, drooping could be we're too hot, drooping could be we're too cold. Just judge which it might be based on when the last time you watered the plant was and how frequently you're having to water the plant. And once again, as with all house plants, try to avoid any direct drafts from AC or heat on your hibiscus. So what kind of humidity do these plants like? Well, they are native to very tropical areas, so ideally they do want slightly higher humidity. However, mine has done fine in the regular humidity in my house. I haven't had to use a humidifier or anything like that. But I do find that when you're propagating them, which we're gonna get into here in a little bit, that the propagations do need slightly higher humidity humidity and I will explain when we talk about propagation how I accomplish that. So I mentioned earlier that blooming, especially when you have a hibiscus indoors, can sometimes be difficult and sometimes it just won't happen. But one of the key things to blooming is making sure that you're fertilizing correctly. And so this plant does grow, like I said, pretty quickly in the spring and summer months. And so you want to make sure you're fertilizing on a very regular basis during those times. So I fertilize her minimum once per month during the spring and summer. Sometimes I will even do it once every two weeks. If you are really wanting to get those blooms, I would encourage you to do once every two weeks during those months. Now in the winter, when she stopped growing as much, I definitely was only doing it once per month. There was no need to be doing it once every two weeks, especially since they don't bloom in winter. Now the type of fertilizer you're using in terms of your NPK, because I do use a liquid fertilizer for her. But when it comes to N, P, and K, things are a little bit different for this plant. So what you want to look for when choosing a fertilizer for this plant is a fertilizer that is very high in your nitrogen, which is your N, very low in your phosphorus, which is your P, and then slightly higher, but not as high as the nitrogen in your potassium, which is your K. And the reason for that is that for some reason, phosphorus seems to accumulate more in hibiscus plants than in some other plants. And that phosphorus then binds to minerals and that causes a toxic reaction that can be harmful to the plants. So that's why you wanna make sure you have a NPK that is much lower in phosphorus than it is in nitrogen and potassium. So think about looking for something like a 712 or a 1248. So repotting, how often do you have to repot these beautiful plants. In general, you're going to want to check them once a year as usual. If they are starting to become root bound fairly significantly, then you're going to want to repot them and you're only going to want to take them up one additional pot size. And I've said this before when I did my Monstera Care video that when you have big plants like this, I highly recommend potting them in nursery pots and then putting them in a cover pot like this ceramic pot here because the bigger they get, the harder they can be to get out of those pots and you don't want to have to smash this pot. You don't want to be causing any undue stress to the roots trying to dig in there and get them loose enough to get out. So I really recommend just using those nursery pots to make your life a little bit easier and to not stress out the plant as much. So let's talk about pests next. And I do have some good news for you. These plants are pretty pest resilient. Now that doesn't mean that they aren't going to get pests, but even when they do, they seem to survive infestations much better than other plants. You might not even know you have an infestation for a super long time because it's not even going to exhibit symptoms as quickly as some other plants. But that does not mean that you should not still be regularly checking your hybrid viscous every time you water it to make sure that it doesn't have a pest problem because as always it's easier to get it under control the sooner you find it. But as for the types of pests you might see on this plant, well of course there's the ever so popular spider mites which I'm starting to think they just like 
every type of plant. You also may see mealybugs, you could see aphids. This is a very woody stemmed plant and I do find that scale in my experience is a little bit more common on woodier stem plants than it is on other plants. So that's another one you might see. And then also thrips. Thrips could also be a problem on this plant. Now, if you do find pests on your hibiscus, you may be a little bit intimidated because you're looking at this and you're like, this is a lot of dense foliage. How am I ever gonna get it under control? First thing I will tell you is, one of your best bets is gonna to be to take a hose to this plant on a very hard spray and try to dislodge as many of the pests as possible to start off. So take the plant outside, give it that hard hose spray down, let it completely dry, and then treat it with whatever pest spray you prefer to use. And remember, you are gonna to have to repeat that pest spray at least one week after the first time you do it. I tend to be a little overly cautious when treating it, and I will do it once a week for four weeks straight to hopefully make sure that I have eradicated all those pests. Now, in addition to pests, there are quite a few leaf-related issues and diseases that can happen on hibiscus, although I will tell you, I think they're more common when you're keeping these plants outdoors than they are when you're keeping them indoors but that doesn't mean that it couldn't still happen indoors. So we're gonna cover those real quick here. So the first two are both types of mildew. So one is powdery mildew and mildew is a type of fungus. And in the case of powdery mildew, it starts off as white spots that then turn to kind of a tannish color or a grayish color as that fungus spreads. Now, downy mildew can also be an issue on these plants, which is also a type of fungus. And very similarly to the powdery mildew, the spots can be white, gray, tannish, brownish. And so maybe you're wondering now, well, how the heck am I supposed to know which one it is? Well, with powdery mildew, you're typically gonna be seeing that mildew on both the top and underside of the leaves. Whereas with downy mildew, you're really only gonna be seeing it on the underside of the leaves. Now, botrytis is another thing that you might see on your hibiscus plants that will affect the leaves. And that is a type of gray mold. So if you see a gray mold starting to coat the full surface of the leaves, and also it will get onto the stems as well, that's a sign that you've got a botrytis outbreak. So treatment for all three of these is relatively simple. You wanna very carefully remove all of the affected foliage. Make sure your plant is not near any other plants because fungus and mold have spores. And when you start to remove that affected foliage, those spores can fly off into the air. They can then go and land on your other plants. And now you're gonna have these issues on your other plants. So isolate the plant, glove up, mask up, because you don't wanna be breathing those spores in either. After you've removed all the affected foliage, I really recommend that you give the plant a very good spray down with some type of fungicide. After that, you're just gonna wanna keep a close eye on the plant, make sure nothing is popping back up. If it is, give it a fungicide treatment again, keep removing the affected foliage, and eventually you should get it under control. So next, let's Let's talk about pruning and propagating hibiscus. So every spring, you're going to want to prune your hibiscus back about a third of the way. This is really going to help to keep it into a very bushy growth pattern, especially if you've been seeing that it's been getting very leggy. You want to make sure that you're encouraging it to stay in that bushy growth. I did do that to this plant and you can see that it has already grown a lot more, gotten a lot bushier, and that was about two months ago, I believe. So once again, they pick up growth pretty quickly when spring rolls around. But when you are pruning it back, I would definitely recommend giving propagation a try for this plant. Now, this actually is the very first plant that I ever propagated. You heard that right. I went straight for the hibiscus the first time I ever propagated, not the pothos, not the philodendron, not the ones that everybody says are super easy. I went for the slightly more difficult one. And this is a slightly more difficult one in my opinion, more so because it just takes a long time. And I think a lot of people think it's not working, but it works, trust me, it just takes a while. But you can propagate this either directly into soil or directly into water. I personally find that water is a little bit slower of a method, but you do have less of a chance of having a rot problem when you are propagating the plant if you go to water and then to soil versus straight to soil. Now, regardless of which type you're doing, you're gonna wanna make sure that you take a four to six inch cutting and you wanna cut right below a node as usual, cut it at a 45 degree angle. I do use rooting hormone for this plant, both in water and if I'm doing it directly into soil. So after you've made that cut, you're gonna to wanna to remove all of the lower leaves, only leave the top two leaves, and then you're gonna dip that stem end into that rooting hormone, shake it off a little bit, pop it either into water or directly into soil. Now, most people will tell you you need to take a younger stem, so one that looks green if you don't have a variegated form of hibiscus. As you can see on my plant here, these stems are a pinkish color, so pinkish or greenish depending on the type of hibiscus you have. Everybody says that those are the easier ones to do, that once that stem gets woody and barky, you can't do it. I don't really agree because I have actually successfully propagated multiple cuttings off of this plant that had woodier stems. However, I did expose the stem. So I shaved the bark off the end of the stem for about an inch up that stem before I dipped it into the rooting hormone. 
And that worked for me both in water and directly into soil. Now, if you do go into water and if you've never used rooting hormone when water propagating before, the plant will start to develop all of these weird looking crystals that you're seeing here. That is normal. That actually means that it's working. I think. But don't see that and think, oh my God, there's something weird growing on my plant because there's not. It is actually working fine. As you can see here, there are roots coming out of the stem, but it's been sitting here in water for, I think, four months, maybe even five months now. So that's what I'm saying. The propagation for hibiscus takes a long time. I do think direct soil takes a little bit less time, but you're still looking at probably two to three months before that plant starts to actually develop roots and you start to see new leaf growth. Now, once you have developed roots in water, you can move it into soil, but I do recommend even if you're starting in soil to cover the plant. The propagations for this plant really need higher humidity than the parent plants do. So I cover my pots when I'm propagating them with a plastic bag to help trap that humidity in. And if I see that it's getting a little bit too moist in there, because if it gets too, too moist, you could develop some mold. I will just cut the ends of those plastic bags off to help vent it a little bit. Now, if you go to uncover that plant, let's say you think it's got enough roots, you take it off. It's been watered recently and it starts to droop. Once again, drooping is just what this plant does to tell you it's not happy. In my experience, that was a sign, okay, it still needs higher humidity. And it's really easy for you to figure it out. Just put the bag back on it. If you put the bag back on it and those leaves pop up again, then you know it wasn't ready to be uncovered. It still needs that higher level of humidity. So toxicity, I have some good news for you guys. This particular variety of hibiscus is non-toxic to both cats and dogs and humans. However, there is another type of hibiscus that is toxic to cats, dogs, and humans, and that is commonly called the Rose of Sharon. And scientifically, I believe it's called a hibiscus Syracus is how I think it is pronounced. Now, typically I don't see Rose of Sharon grown indoors very often. It's more of an outdoor plant, but for you pet owners, especially dog owners, you wanna be aware if you are planting those outside that they are toxic to dogs, cats, and humans. And so I hope you have enjoyed this video today. If you own hibiscus, comment down below and let me know. And I'm also super happy to announce that we have officially surpassed 500 subscribers. The community tab should be becoming available for me on my channel here in the next week or so, so be on the lookout for that. And I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to all of you who have subscribed so far. I really greatly appreciate you all. I have enjoyed all of our conversations together. And when this channel blows up one day, you'll be able to say you were one of the first people to subscribe to this channel. And if you have not subscribed yet, don't worry, you can still get in on the ground level here because the big milestone for YouTube is 1000 subscribers. And that is our next goal. So go ahead and hit that subscribe and or like button down below. And you also can say that you were there before this channel blew up. Thank you for joining me today, you guys, and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Aloha!